will uh, begin then. Um, it's uh, a very great pleasure for the first of our um, 50th anniversary lectures to introduce uh, Dr. Rosie Campbell from Birkbeck. Um, Rosie and I arrived at Southampton in the same year, um, so I was appointed to junior lectureship in 1995, arrived in July, and then in October, Rosie uh, appeared and took many political theory courses through her undergraduate degree uh, before moving to the dark side. Uh, um, I was so, tempted by the ESRC. Yeah, ESRC bribed her with money. I mean, oh, what can you <laughs> yeah, do? Um, so, uh, Ro Rosie did uh, undergrad and masters here, and that's one of the reasons we're very grateful for her to coming back for the for the anniversary. Um, she joined Birkbeck in two thousand and three, and is reader in politics there, working on issues of gender and politics, voting, representation, um, political participation, political careers. Um, her book, 2006 book, uh, Gender and the Vote, uh, was, I think, you know, widely liked uh, in the relevant uh, circles. And she's actually just come hot foot from being interviewed uh, for Newsnight tonight um, on a slight tiff with disagreement with Harry Harman. Uh, on missing women voters who are missing. Um, so uh, it's a great pleasure to have her here and tonight she's going to talk about sovereignty of the people, public opinion and political representation. I must admit I tweaked the title slightly because I, I had promised to, to look at the constitution and then I realised that I was really trying to twist myself in knots so forgive me for using the word representation. Um, I'm really, really delighted to be here. Um, I wouldn't be a political scientist now if it wasn't for David Owen and other colleagues that were in the department at the time, Peter John, Johnny Lundusky. Um, so I have you entirely to blame. Um, and so I've come here to seek my revenge. Um, and I, I think this has been a really useful exercise for me and that it's made me, forced me to think about what is it that I actually do. And I, I don't know, um, I know most of the audience I think are academics and a few students. But I think in the kind of academic world now, where we're very focused on getting our outputs and the next one and the next one, we don't actually always stop and think, what's the bigger picture? What's the bigger story? What is all this about? What's at the core? And this has been a useful exercise for me, trying to fit into the Constitution, trying to force me to think about bigger issues. And it's made me realize what I am interested in. And um, the sovereignty of the people is an idea. I suppose I went into studying public opinion, as David said, not because that was what massively motivated me. It was because I was interested in theoretical questions about the representation of women's priorities, preferences, and concerns. And the way in that provided ESRC funding for my PhD student was to reconfigure those citizens as voters and to, and to think about trying to understand those problems that way. And I really have gone over to the dark side because not only did I take the money, I have swallowed the pill as well because I now am convinced that this is a useful way to think about these things. I don't think, I certainly um, don't think it's the only way, but I think there's a lot of data out there about public opinion that can help us tease out some of the empirical problems that underlie the theoretical questions that motivate us as political scientists. And I'm taking a subset of those questions today. Political representation, the sovereignty of the people. And these ideas are maybe not fully fleshed out yet, so I'll be interested in your comments, but I have, I have tried, to, tried to think about this. What is the sovereignty of the people in terms of representation? What do we mean by that? Do we mean, uh, usually we mean the representation of kind of policy preferences or substantive representation of ideas. And when we look at public opinion and we look at the behavior of our politicians, we want to see a congruence between those two things if we think democracy is working. So the kind of story I'm going to take you through, drawing on bits of my research, could be there are lots of other bits of other people's research that would flesh out this story. So I'm really using my research as illustrative examples of what I hope is a sort of broad case. Um, and I think that if you try and think about the literature on public opinion and representation, 
A lot of it problematizes the descriptive and substantive representation of women and then following that, ethnic minorities. There's an absolutely massive literature on the descriptive and substantive representation of women, just starting with where are the women? Are they in parliaments? Are they in um, all kinds of different levels of elected office? Are they party members? Are they voters? Just basic descriptive representation. And then there's a bigger question. What about the substantive representation of women? Can men substantively represent women? Can male politicians do that? Can, can Sarah Palin substantively represent women? And, you know, feminist researchers get themselves in all kinds of knots about this. What do you do? We, we tend to, when we talk about the representation of women, as academics often have a very feminist conception, a liberal feminist conception, of what that representation of women is. But actually, if you have a politician like Sarah Palin, his view of what women have her representative claims in Mike Seward's terms about women would be very, very different from mine. It's, she's the exception. She, may, she, has, she has dealt with her children up elsewhere, but other women should really be at home with their children. And how do you deal with the, 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 the conservative representation of women's interests? And those are the kind of difficult problems that the, that, that body of literature considers. And I think that then there's a, there's a sort of resurgent interest in some of the other ways that descriptive representation might be linked to substantive representation, a resurgence of interest in social class and background, um, and also factors that seem to be of less interest perhaps to academics, but are very salient in terms of public opinion. Because this idea of sovereignty of the people, unfortunately sometimes they do things you don't like. Um, and the sovereignty of the people this is exactly what's happened to me today, actually. If you, one of the reasons I like doing this kind of quantitative research is it forces you to face um, unattractive problems that you would rather avoid. So Harriet Harman's all over the place saying there are 9 million missing women voters. In fact, I think she's saying 9.1 million. It sounds very precise. It sounds very convincing. I'm seeing it on my Facebook page coming up. This is happening. Um, what I worked out is that she got the House of Commons Library to get the 2010 British election study and she got them to break down turnout in the last election and what they did was they weighted the data by, so this is people saying I voted or not or I did, I did or didn't vote, and they weighted the data by um, whether they actually did vote. If you go back into the data and just look at a very simple question, did the people in this survey vote or not, there's no gender difference. And I think this is one of the issues about doing the quantitative research is I don't really want to take Harriet Harman on for going around, running around saying, at this election, the representation of women's interests is really important because 78% of British politicians are men, most of the time women politicians are sidelined, very often women's issues are sidelined or they become a sort of media news frame for a little while, Worcester woman, um, mum's net election. There's a short time frame when People notice women voters and then they forget about them and move on. And so I don't really want to criticise politicians who are taking this issue seriously, but I'm forced to deal with this unattractive problem because the data makes me. And I, that's one of the things that draws me to this kind of research, is trying to deal with this issue, what is represented? What is the sovereignty of the people? Um, you know, how do we actually get at that? Um, is it through our conceptual understanding? Do we have ideas of false consciousness and that these conservative women just don't really understand what the representation of women is? Or do we have to accept that there can be multiple claims and, and, and how do we arbitrate between them? I'm not going to tell I'm not going to pretend I'm going to give an answer to that today. <laughs> but I am going to try and elucidate how I think surveys of public opinion can provide insight into tensions within the voice of the people. Um, and that tension is in of itself interesting. Okay, so I mean, I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted here and you don't need me. I mean, there's people in this room who will know representation theory in much more detail than I do. But at its most simple form, representation is just simply making citizens and opinions, particularly in democratic theory, opinions, at least according to Pickin, ideas the most important thing, making them present. Bodies, descriptive representation, counting heads, less important. If your ideas are there, that should be enough if your ideas are represented. And we have the you know, very, very well-known um, delegate versus trustee debate in terms of what 
kind of um, representatives do we want? Do the, do the people want? What kind of representatives do the people want? Do they want to have representatives who act as delegates and just follow what they consider to be in their own interest? Or do they use their intellectual capacities to work out what they think is in their constituents' interests? So who knows? Who makes the claim? Who has the, the, who has the um, authority to say what this representation is? We have So according to Pitkin, substantive representation, the representation of ideas, um, or perhaps policy responsiveness is often how we think of it, is acting in the interest of the representative represented in a manner responsive to them. Um, but there's a problem here in the British context um, that if you think about Norton, Norton and Wood talk about policy representation in the UK, or substantive representation in the UK as having a tridentic is that right, structure um, with the voter, the party, and the MP. And so the simple idea that the representative and the voter operate in, as a pair is muddied. Where do we expect to see this policy representation? Is it that your MP or your representative acts for you? Or does Parliament as a whole act for you? Or does the political party who represents you act for you, or that you vote for? Um, and I think that you wouldn't immediately think that quantitative research has very much to say about this. But actually, I think the literature on policy congruence is directly targeted at this question. It looks at the extent to which there's a match between either voters and representatives, often in the US, the focus is because of the weaker party system, is on the voter and the representative, and to what extent does the voter respond to the behaviour of the representative, and to what extent is that conditioned by the policy um, congruence between the two. And in party systems, it often considers the congruence between the voter and the party as a collective. So where does descriptive representation sit, sit here? Well, I've put Mary Wollstonecraft in the bottom corner because I wrote my dissertation on Mary Wollstonecraft here when I was doing my master's supervised by David Owen. And um, I went to see him thinking about knew vaguely what I wanted to study. And um, he told me what I wanted to study was um, the gender politics of Mary Wollstonecraft. And I went away and realised that is what I wanted to do. And um, it, it worked out very well. And I think, I suppose I want to juxtapose her against Burke, who was on the previous slide. Because Burke is saying... The representation of policy responsiveness, of substantive representation of ideas, is all that matters. And that we must make sure as a collective that we, do, we look after the interests of the nation. And we have to use our rationale, our reason, we have to actually work out what the interests of the nation are collectively. We can't expect ignorant individual voters to be able to aggregate up what that interest would be. Um, but then we have... You know, Mary Wollstonecraft's inject interjection of saying that actually those bodies maybe matter. Um, that actually you might think you, Edmund Burke, are able to embody the interests of the nation, but you see the interests of the nation through your own embodiment, through the fact that you're a chap and a certain kind of chap in a certain time and place, and that therefore he's not able to make a legitimate claim to be able to represent or to understand what it is he ought to represent. And so in the feminist research on representation, we have this tension between descriptive and substantive representation. Feminists, liberal feminist researchers are usually interested in substantive representation and started off quite crudely just looking at, do women act for women? And I think that literature has expanded over the years to show that actually it's, you shouldn't conflate um, women's bodies with feminist minds. And it's quite possible to have feminist minds in male bodies and anti-feminist minds in female bodies. But that there's still, the empirical research shows us that there is a correlation between the presence of women and the substantive representation of women. But it's messy and it's muddy and it's not the straightforward plop women in and it will all, representation of women will magically happen. And so we come to Anne Phillips's policy of presence, where she argued that the reason you need women's bodies in Parliament 
um, is because actually women don't know what they want. Not in a uh, you know sort of vague witch shoes kind of um, way, but in a actually politics is a deliberative process, and understanding what's in the interests of a group requires um, uncrystallized interests to be brought together and to come out through a process of deliberation. And I find that argument very convincing. And it gives us the opportunity for an empirical test. And that's where, just to give you a little example from my own research about how we might use surveys of public opinion to think about, we can't prove from this kind of research that descriptive representation leads to substantive representation. But what I think you can show is evidence of these uncrystallized interests, latent interests. And so here we have um, some work I did with Sarah Charles and Johnny Lovendusky on um, a, a simple elite mass comparison of attitudes. And we have um, the British election study data here. And we have another example of the empirical research throwing up findings that challenged our thinking in that we had what we thought was a straightforward feminism index that measured how feminist the respondents were. And it included attitudes to whether women should be at home, whether women should take an equal role in, in um, business and so on, and also attitudes to the representation of women in politics. There should be more women in politics. Um, we think that it was, it's um, maybe necessary to use things like a women's shortlist to get more women in politics. And we thought this is just kind of one thing, and if you agreed to all these things, you were feminist, and it would just add up, and you get a rating. But when we ran the factor analysis on the data, what we found was there were two quite distinct, um, distinct categories of what we, were, what we were thinking of as feminism actually had two components. And one of them was hostility to traditional gender roles, and the other's attitudes to the descriptive representation of women in politics, should they actually be there. And what we found was something that we hadn't expected. If you look by um, birth cohort, older people are less hostile, hostile to traditional gender roles, as you might expect. Younger people, more hostile to traditional gender roles. When you look at attitudes to the descriptive representation of women, you get absolutely the reverse. So younger people are much more hostile to things like quotas than older people. And this is where I think I can have a constitutional tweak here, because I think this is about how do, how do, how do um, voters, how, do they, how would they like the political system to operate? And actually, one thing that we know is that quotas, in terms of delivering representation of women, are very, very unpopular with voters, even if they deliver the results. So that's one constitutional tweak that is not something that the voters would demand but you might have an idea that it's in their interests. And that's kind of what we're saying here. We're um, being very Burkean and saying, well, you just don't know what's in your own interest. Because if you're a woman in this survey, what you don't realize is that in every age group, the women are more feminist than the men. So in every single age group, even though the biggest trend is by gen, um, by age, or birth cohort, there's a gap between men and women. And then the sort of final point about this is that we find that very much the same thing amongst the elites. This is candidates and MPs in the British representation study. The age effects are less pronounced, I think, because um, obviously candidates and um, elites often have more um, consolidated ideas, perhaps less influenced by their age. But what we do see is these very profound gender gaps. And so what we argue is that the women might be walking around thinking that their colleagues feel the same about them on these issues, and so might the voters, but they're wrong. And so, actually, women, even though women think they don't need women MPs, perhaps they do. Um, and so this is a rather convoluted argument to say, we think this is evidence of the uncrystallized interests. Um, they're not formulated in demands. There's no one demanding, I want quotas, quite the opposite. But then when you dig down into the data, you find this congruence between the attitudes of women in the, in the electorate and women in the, in the elite. And we think this suggests you might need more women in the elite in order to represent women in, in the electorate. I promise I'm not going to talk about women in one time. Go on. Um, so moving on from gender, The, the 
research on descriptive representation is largely focused on gender, but with a, 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 a literature on ethnicity that's maybe two thirds of the size. And then other factors, whether the, whether the, the descriptive representation of age, education, occupation, local connections matter to voters, much less studied. Do voters care about whether their representatives are women, whether they're from the same ethnic background as them? is really quite well studied, but these issues less so. And so I think some of you are going to hate this, um, but I'm going to show you anyway. So um, this is research I've done with Phil Cowley, and we're not pretending that this is what happens in the real world. Quite the opposite. It's a little survey experiment, and what we're saying is, what would happen if voters had perfect information? We know they don't, but what kind of preferences would they exhibit for their representatives just in terms of descriptive representation, they might have in their mind some latent idea that it will produce substantive representation um, if, we, if we give them real information. So here's John. He's 48 years old, born and brought up in your area, blah, 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 married with three children. And here is George. And the two, um, and, uh, the respondents in the survey simply have to choose between the two candidates. And what we do throughout all the different iterations of these various candidates' um, tests we've done, I think we have about five papers on these candidate surveys tests now, is gradually run through all of these factors to see what makes a difference. And this was my interest in this started from my feminist motivation to consider um, you know, the representation of women and maybe women would care, they would like women, they would rate women politicians differently, they would respond to that. Um, that is not what we found. So again, um, challenging my preconceived ideas. What we found amongst the British electorate is that they, and other research has shown this time and again, don't really penalise women um, candidates. That effect isn't statistically significant. Sadly, for a lot of this, a lot of people in this room, having a PhD gives you no electoral benefit. If any of you are considering studying for office. We didn't see any. Um, ethnicity effects, although the only way we did that was with, through name, and we had a lot of people not answer the question. So there's a bit of social desirability there, recognising that someone's called Mohammed and stepping away from the question. Um, so I wouldn't want to claim that that means that there's no bias against ethnic minority candidates. But as you move along the line, you can see there's not very much going on with age. Then we start to go to more significant effects. And again, not good news for any of you in this room, the candidates who left school at 16 and 18 were by far more popular than any of the other candidates. But I've simplified this massively. We've done lots of different tests with different ages and different um, levels of education. And basically, I think it, this is all part of the rejection of the idea of this elite political class that people in the general public are showing us they believe is formed. Um, the idea that they think their representatives don't represent them in terms of at least descriptive representation. Um, the GP is very popular. So, and, and also locality, which is of course something that I've skipped over and not even mentioned. But at the very core of our political system is the representation of local areas. That's how it works. And I haven't even really mentioned it. And boy, does it matter to voters much more than whether their MP is a woman. And also, they don't like rich people. So, <laughs> doesn't seem to stop everyone voting for them, mind you. Um, obviously, the, these effects will vary within subgroups, and I've really <coughs> simplified a lot of papers here just to give you a general overview. But I think what you can take away from it is that some of the things that have preoccupied me are not the things that are keeping voters awake at night. Um, the issue about the, what voters want, or that the people. Um, would express if they had full, not full um, information, are much more around this rejection of the political class. Um, and whether you'd have got the same effects if you'd gone back in time, that I cannot answer. And I think this puts some of the political questions like we were talk I was talking about earlier in terms of the representation of women, where I've been involved in research that looks at quotas for women, I'm a strong advocate of quotas for women, and yet I'm someone who studies public opinion to try and understand <laughs> what it is that needs to be, to understand political representation, to understand substantive representation, and I look and don't like what I see, that creates a, a challenge. And my argument about quotas would be that 
People don't like the idea of quotas, but David Cutts has done research that's shown that women politicians who've been elected through quotas are not punished. So they don't really notice that that's happened. And they don't, voters don't care whether you put up a woman or a man. There's no punishment effect, there's no reward effect. So the discrimination doesn't happen at the level of the voter. It happens during the party selectorate, during the party mechanism. And actually, perhaps that means it's within that that the critique comes. It's about rectifying discrimination at the party level rather than demands from the electorate, but maybe you might disagree with me there. Okay, so I'm skipping through these. So this leads me on to right back to the beginning to um, Burke and the issues that are raised in the classic literature about what, it, what political representation involves. So I've gone through this whole meandering journey through the things that have um, preoccupied um, empirical researchers in terms of the representation of women and ethnic minorities, and yet we come back to the centre periphery debate. What is it that sh what is it that needs to be represented? The local, discrete area, the constituency, or is it about the national interest? And what is it that's demanded by voters? And so there's a lot of research now, a growing, growing body of research showing that voters demand local MPs. What that word local means is very difficult to unpick. Because if you look at, um, I'm in the, at the moment, I'm the principal investigator of an ESRC-funded candidate study. And as part of that work, we're collecting information from um, candidates' own websites. Everybody's a local, you know, everyone is local. If you could say that you once visited, I mean, I'm local to Southampton, aren't I? You know, if I come and stand in Southampton, whatever way that a candidate can, can to make a claim to be a local, just a local representative, they will. And I often think the politicians don't need evidence. They, they have experience, and they're often right, and, and sometimes the political scientists are behind the curve and voters really want local candidates. But it's something that you have to, um, representatives have to make a claim. They have to set up a case and a narrative. What does it mean to be local? Um, so this is something that with Johnny Lovendusky, um, we try to unpick a little bit and compare what do MPs think is the most important thing about their, their representative role? What are the most important functions of being an MP? And what do voters think? And it, we expected to find a lot of difference. We thought that, people, that, that representatives would be motivated to go into politics by their own sense of what they thought the interests of their constituents or the nation were, and that they would not be terribly interested in what the actual expectations of their own constituents or voters were. And we found a surprising amount of congruence between what MPs said they thought were the most important duties or roles of, the, of an MP and what voters rated as the most important. So there are some slight differences in this figure. MPs slightly more often selected contributing to the development of legislation. 16% of MPs and 7% of voters ranking it first. It's a massive difference. And the public think that taking part in, part in parliamentary debates is slightly more important than MPs do. 1.3% of MPs and 4.3% of voters. And that's surely just because MPs know what's involved in taking part in parliamentary debates. Um, and so we don't see a huge amount of difference when we look at it at this top line level. But what we, to look at it in more detail, we created a constituency preference variable, a constituency index. Um, and it's very simple. If um, a measure was a constituency focused item and it wasn't given a score of one to three, they didn't rank it as one to three in their most important issue, um, MP's roles, it's given zero up to three if it's ranked first. And then if it was a non-constituency item in the other way, you can take them away and get a total constituency score. And here we see for MPs, it's 2.12, and for voters, 2.64. So you probably don't care about the technical stuff. But what it means is, just on average, um, voters are a little bit more constituency focused than MPs, that's the takeaway, which we were surprised it wasn't bigger than that. But is, is the heterogeneity in there that would be of interest? Well, yes. So. When we think about that trustee delegate debate, there are party effects. 
In general, MPs are less considered, convinced about the importance of constituency presence and voters, but the differences are small. But if you look at the Conservative and Labour Party, the voters think the constituency aspect of the MP's role is more important than the voters do. The Liberal Democrats and the other parties behave in the reverse way. And of course, given we know how our electoral system works, that makes sense. The other parties don't have banks of safe seats that they can, um, well, not banks of them, too, but they don't have banks of safe seats that they can rely on. And so our whole system of party democracy, historically focusing on those two main parties, is, is focused on a version of representation, of, of substantive representation, which is based at the party level and not at the individual voter constituent level. And yet, in those, um, if you among the other parties, the Liberal Democrats and the others, actually that constituency um, representative, that voter representative function is much, well, it's more salient, obviously, it's much more salient. And then breaking this down by year of entry on the um, short left hand side, isn't it? We can see a trend over time that actually newer entrants to the House of Commons are more constituency focused than previous cohorts. Um, and that might just be that when you're a newer entrant, you've got your seat and you feel that you've got to kind of make it really comfortable and make everyone like you and do lots of, lots of work in those early years. I think the fact that the trend goes down in a linear way, so even um, MPs who entered the House in 97 to 2009 are more constituency focused than those who entered pre-97. Um, we did run regressions and control for marginality and so on, and this, this, this holds. And so I think there's some evidence here, I want to generate more evidence, but there's some evidence that actually new entrants of MPs are behaving a different way. Obviously, that's in the wake of the expensive scandal. We can't ignore that. But I also think it's in response to this demand from voters in terms of what it is they want from their representatives, that the old party, demo the party democracy model isn't as attractive as it used to be, that political part that thinking that you can have your ideas your substantively represented through a political party is not satisfying to voters in the way it used to be, and politicians have cottoned on, and they're starting to step aside from the party line to some extent and to try and develop and encourage that relationship between the voter and the um, representative more. And we can see what you'd expect to see, a very strong marginality effect. Yes, of course, they work harder on their constituency roles when they are in a marginal constituency. And this is another paper. Oh, I should have just used that one. That was a joint, was it? Um, so this is with um, Phil Cowley, Nick Vivian, and Marcus Wagner. And um, this is a big paper, and I've just put one graph in, so let me <laughs> whisk through quickly. But basically, we're looking at how satisfied voters are with their own MP relative to how independent-minded they think their MP is. And what we see is that, on average, voters prefer their MP who's to be very independent-minded or fairly independent-minded. And the huge literature on roll call voting tends to look at dissent from the party line as an indicator of policy congruence, so substantive representation. Um, I'm not going to run through all the tests here, but we go through various tests to try and look to see whether actually um, we see policy congruence operating here? Are they more satisfied with their MP? Because they think when their MP dissents, it indicates that they're on the same side in terms of policy. And so, for example, we look at um, if their MP, if they're a very, very left-wing um, voter, and their MP is a Labour MP who is dissenting, they might assume that that Labour MP is on the left, because most rebels in the Labour Party are on the left and the Conservative Party on the right. We see absolutely no relationship. Um, we also control for whether they um, actually know something about their MP, knowledge about their MP, the relationship still remains. And we, through a series of tests controlling for socio-demographics, um, come to the view that we think MP dissent, both in terms of rebellion, but also speaking out, because 
Ordinary voters don't really get to. How do they find out whether their MP rebels? A few people who are very highly interested in politics and probably are in that kind of um, substantive representation mode of going and seeing what did my MP do on Iraq? You bastard, are going to punish you. Most don't behave that way at all. Most obviously don't. It's, and what we think hap is happening now is that dissent is acting as a valence signal. It's basically just saying something about the character of the MP, almost a personality effect. Are you someone who's prepared to speak out from the party line? And actually, yesterday morning, Isabel Hartman in the Spectator blog, which is always a go-to for me, um, said exactly this. She said that when we think about the next election, and you, know, you might sort of think that a workable majority might be 335. She says, no, the Conservatives are thinking they can't actually rely on any Liberal Democrats who are not on the payroll. They can't even really, really rely on their own backbenchers. And she said explicitly that the reason is that the MPs are thinking about their constituency and they need to show that they are not just following the party line. <coughs> and our argument in this paper is that perhaps we're moving beyond the party democracy model where we have a strong party system. And it's looking a bit more like the states, where if you're a whip, you actually understand that your particular um, legislators have, um, they've got to think about the local context. And you have to be sympathetic to that. And you have to give a bit of quid pro quo and let them off that vote. And I think that that's part of this potential personalization of politics or the descriptive representation coming to the fore. You know, Burke would be rolling in his grave. Where has the policy content gone? And I suppose that sounds quite a bleak assessment. So I've started off looking at the substantive representation of women's ideas. That's what I care about. I want to see it happening. And move through to find that actually there's some evidence of that going on. But also what most voters care about um, seems to be increasingly, I wouldn't want to overstate the case, but increasingly Things that we might think were incidental, where you were born, um, you know, what you did for a living before, what your surname is, these couple was less important, so I won't stress that one, but um, these things are considered to be sort of personality politics, it's sort of dumbed down politics. Um, and we might be slightly concerned about the state of our democracy if that is what people are concerned about, rather than actually thinking about ideas and identifying with the party. But I think it's obvious that in the current situation with partisan dealignment, that the party system that we've had in Britain in, in the 20th century is under increasing stress, and that perhaps it isn't quite as um, damning of voters as it might originally sound, because the parties have relentlessly pursued their strategic short-term interest to go after those median target voters. To get, you know, the reason they're getting in that bloody pink bus and driving around the country is because women are more likely to be in the undecided category of voters. So they're going to marginal seats and they're seeking out undecided voters. And they're the ones they're trying to represent. That's how political representation is working. And voters have noticed and they don't like it. And they like the MP who actually is from their local area, maybe knows something about their local area, has had a similar life experience to them. Um, shows that they're not just going to follow the party line. And they think, you know what, Anne Phillips was right, Wollstonecraft's right, Burke's wrong. That's it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tracy. Um, so, uh, I guess 15 years ago I was, I was slightly sad that uh, Rosie didn't do a PhD in political theory because I think I was not give her any money. Uh, but I have to say, um, this talk helps me sort of, in a sense, come to thought that what one really needs is good political scientists who've had a thorough training in political <laughs> theory. <laughs> uh, thank you very much indeed, it's extremely interesting. Um, so, we are now open for um, questions, comments, uh, and uh, Debate and Will is twitching. Do uh, you hear hard time? <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> anyway, let's start with Ben. I'm political philosopher. <laughs> so, like when I hear this, I just make me think that you know, there are serious problems with our representation system, and perhaps one of those problems is the way that 
representation becomes a local issue because we elect you know, MPs to represent Southampton or you know, whatever. And you know, there are lots of different ways that we can structure the representative system. If you thought that age was a more important category, then you could put voters into uh, constituencies according to their age rather than their job. Or you could you know, design all female constituencies of all male constituencies, which would, I suppose, no, it wouldn't quite be like a quota. You wouldn't have to say that women's constituencies had to be women. But you, know, you would have people who clearly um, did in some so sense. Group representation. Group. Hmm? group representation, really. It's, it's yeah. of um, Iris Marion Young, really, I think what you're saying, isn't it? Um, I don't, I don't you, the women don't have to live in constituencies together, do they? No. So, isn't that very... Yeah. yeah. But, you know, like instead of having, I don't know, because I'm new to Southampton, I'm not quite sure how Southampton's done anyway, but do we have like north and south Southampton or west and east or whatever? You know, if you're going to have two MPs for Southampton, you, you could just have all the men in Southampton who vote for one MP and all the women in Southampton vote for different. Um, I, mean, yeah. I think that's wonderful, but my, my problem with that is, I mean, I, I think group representation there's a danger of making essentialist claims about, I mean, how do you decide what needs to be represented? And I think that you can say if groups have been historically discriminated against, then you can make a case. But actually, I would hope at some utopian point in time, there'd be no point in having the women's representative and the men's representative. And so that is the problem with that argument. I think the other problem with it is, you're saying you could design. Who's the you in your sentence? Because certainly that is what I would design. But my difficulty is that when I go and look at public opinion, which is, of course, to some extent led by the political situation that people are in, um, that's not what they're asking for. No, but I, I was wondering whether um, you emphasise you know, the importance of locality to members of public or voters. But I was wondering whether, to some extent, that's an artefact of the fact that you know, they're told this is your local representative. Yeah, of think, course, I if think, we were to redesign, if we were to adopt an Israeli yeah, type system, yeah. we would just have Close the national list. PR. But you know, what do voters care about in Israel? Presumably, they don't care about local ties because they understand representation in you know, a different So that's, I think, a bit in a more Burkean fashion. It would be really interesting to do some comparative research to check that, whether if you've got a closed list system, people stop thinking about their regional and local identities. I suspect that's not the case. I think people's regional and local identities are their, their everyday lived experience and are often more important to them, um, depending on you know, how society is structured. You know, in our society, gender differences are, are very much less salient than they used to be. But I think even in the past, people put loyalty to, to family and local connection probably higher. And so us standing back as our normative theorists you know, might have a different view. But actually, if you look at what people actually want. So I think the locality is probably pretty central. I, I mean, I, this, is a, this is more of an abstract debate than, than, than one that I can prove with evidence, but it's an interesting question. Justin. Yeah, thanks for the talk. It's really interesting. Um, could you go back to the graph, um, or you don't have to go back. I can, I can talk do about that. Uh, the one with the different impacts, um, with the, it was the red bar graph where the large one, yeah, that one. So when I was looking at this, what I was thinking about is I, I, I wonder if what's going. I wonder if there might be some sort of psychological process where the the respondent basically, because perhaps they 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 see the uh, income of the candidate to be so important that it's almost like any other properties sort of lose their significance in the in the respondent's mind relative to what they clearly see as the most important um, sort of determinant. I, I, so, so it's actually a really rather simple question. I'm just curious if you if you considered an interaction between gender and these these money categories. We actually we did subdivide all the exp experiments by basic socio-demographics, and we were astounded by what a difference it made. Um, so, uh, one thing that we haven't done is to see you know on rich it, on, on the we've done that on the respondent side. We haven't looked to see if rich women are treated differently from rich men, say. Yeah, that's what I'm asking. Yeah. I, want, I yeah. wonder if I wonder if you might find something interesting there. Because, yeah, yeah. We have interacted them with party because obviously in the real world, um, party is much more important usually, or at least we think it is, than these things. And um, party reduces the localism 
and the occupation effect, but only by about half, and they still remain really salient. Um, we, that's not what we expected to find. Mm. Because right. on the sort of locality and why this locality matter issue, I mean, one of the things that seems to have happened um, is that uh, particularly the Labour Party, the Labour Conservatives as well, is the selection of party candidates has become subject to much more central party mm -hmm. control. So I'm kind of wondering whether you've tested in a sense for whether part of the locality issue is actually a reaction against the parachuting in of candidates as well. Elsewhere is a kind of reassertion of the importance of, as it were, kind of local party yeah. uh, stuff against that central control, yeah. which fits into the elite political class. Yeah. I mean, I think that's really interesting, and I bet it does matter in some individual constituencies, but these effects are sort of robust across a range of people. So I think there's something happening beyond that, because most people don't actually follow local politics that much, and they're not necessarily having um, a candidate parachuted in. What these experiments are absolutely useless at getting is that kind of nuance of what happens in a particular constituency. But I think they do show it's just so, um, so the, the size effects are so strong that it's more than just something about the party. There, there is a sort of, I mean, we have, um, it's in the field now, so I'm going to be able to look at the results, but we've tried in various different ways to unpick um, what, is is, what is it that people care about in being local. And one of the things that comes out is that being born somewhere is really popular. I suppose it's really hard to fake, isn't it? <laughs> you know? So people really want some kind of what they believe is really true representation of local well, there's a few tea will tell you a barn has been faking in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Matt? I think what's a bit off. Um, uh, two really quick questions. So one thing that was interesting is this is most data on Britain obviously I'm presenting. And it's really interesting with the quotas thing. There's people hate quotas and hate them more and more and more and more and more every year. Oh, no, no, that's not necessarily true. No? Okay, all right. But um, you can say one with that. I mean, my question is going to be what's the cross national, do you have global cross national scene on this? Uh, my impression, like just anecdotally from moving through different countries, is that people seem really anti quotas here compared to other places. That's just something. There's definitely cross national variation. I mean, in the States, the idea that they'd have. have um, have the gender quotas, any political party operating gender quota is just laughable and that's because of the history of affirmative action and, and the political backlash against it. And I think we're somewhere between a lot of European countries that have quotas and, um, and the states. And it's something about our kind of Anglo-Saxon view of what meritocracy is and, 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 and our sort of blindness to some kinds of discrimination, I think. So I think it, I think it, it does mean what do you want to say about uh, things not being quite so bad? About but I haven't seen evidence that it's getting worse. It's not about to reach 100%. Um, it's, I mean, quotas, there's no point kind of saying that people like them. Like I had written down, I didn't say it out loud. Um, well, I didn't say it at all, whether it's out loud or not. Um, so a UCAP poll conducted for the Times in August 2014 found that 56% of the British public are opposed to women shortlists. 63% of men and 51% of women. Um, so it's, you know, they're, they're not popular. So, let me ask one more bit. Um, the, uh, the slide you had about, you were kind of talking about whether representation, so you had these kind of, uh, I was, you had oh. this declining, so was it all the blue Which ones out to the side? Was it declining, yeah, yeah, this one. So, um, uh, I found this really interesting, but I mean, my, my assumption straight away was that it's incumbency of man. Right. We, we, I mean, I've really simplified these papers and just shown you oh, yeah. basics. We have run regression models and control for things like that. Um, I, I'm not, I'm not completely wedded to this. I'd want more years to test. Is this something that is a kind of? It looks to me as if it's going in the right direction, and it makes intuitive sense that as voters are demanding a focus on the constituency more. I mean, we know that we know that MPs are actually spending more time on this stuff than they used to. I mean, they're mail bags, including their electronic mail bags, have swirled beyond comparison. So it ma makes sense, but I don't think we can absolutely prove it here. Um, can I ask something about the connection between the, the dissenting character argument 
and the locality mm -hmm. are the dreams. Because one thing is, um, if voters, you know, in a sense, like an MP who dissents some of the time, mm -hmm. okay. So one question is, how do they know about that? Uh, uh, there may be some people who go on, you know, they work for you and look at voting records like I do for my local scumbag MP. Um, um, <laughs> um, there's a very loyal record, uh, uh, which hopefully will work against them. Uh, um, uh, but, I mean, most people aren't going to do, to do that. So, at least, it seems likely, or plausible anyway, that a, the things MPs may be motivated to dissent on may be tied to local mm -hmm. issues, and B, even where they may dissent on a wider range of things, the things that get publicity for dissent will be through the local papers and tied to local mm -hmm. issues. So I guess the kind of question here on the character thing is, is it dissent that's doing the work or independence, or is it locality again? Mm, that's really interesting. I think, well, whether they know or not, we, we are able to, so we're viewing, we're conceptualising dissent as being broader than just parliamentary rebellion, because we yeah. think exactly as you're saying, what's the mechanism for a voter to, um, to know, other than you, if you're a typical voter, um, to know whether they're, um, whether they're a few votes with the party or not, and it's going to be through local national news media. Um, and actually, uh, an example would be Sarah Wollaston, who, um, has voted against her party 3.9% of the time, compared to Philip Hollibone, who's voted against his party for 20, but with the Tories 20% of the time. Now, I don't think people think Sarah Williston is as rebellious as Philip Hollibone, but they certainly think she's independent. But she's actually quite loyalist on her voting record. Mm -hmm. And the reason they think she's independent is because she talks, she speaks out against the party line. And so in our conceptualization, if you can get that reputation of being an independent MP, that's likely to send a valence signal about breaking away from the sort of party mould. But whether it's simply reflecting, oh, and the other thing we did was we correlated the perceived independence of the respondent's own MP against their actual level of rebellion. We can't do it against dissent because we'd never be able to get a measure of it, but the actual level of rebellion. And there is a relationship. It's muddy, as it's expected to be, but it's statistically significant. So we think there's more going on than just a sort of tautological thing where people like their MP, so they think they're independent. You know, there is some, there is some real information driving that. Um, whether it is driven by entirely local demand, or whether if you're Sarah Wollaston and you're speaking out against NHS reforms and you get kudos for that, I can't unpick it. But I, I, I would have thought that it probably would involve both kinds policy content on the national level. We were always saying the policy content is, see, is, is less important than just being seen to be independent, but I would have thought in individual cases it would start, that so you'd have a reputation. I mean, she also has the benefit of being elected on an open primary and being a GP, I mean, she's got all kinds of things. Going on. Is that a sort of answer? Is it sort of a non answer? Well, no, no, I think it's just <laughs> yeah. really interesting, really interesting to, to push it further. Up in terms of when they think about the MPs independence, mm. that's kind of one thing. And then you ask them, well, kind of what are the issues through which, in a sense, signal that independence, you know, and... I think you've got more faith in the average voter than me. As I think you would be able to say, yes, well, he did this, 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 and this, assuming it's he, I don't think the local MP I ought to. Um, but I think most voters, it, I mean, we, we do, and we actually, one of these surveys actually asks, the political knowledge question is a zero to three score. Do you know the name? And they can get it sort of right, the sex and the part of your MP. And you know, an awful lot of people don't know any of those things. It depends a little bit on what you're asking. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some interesting Danish studies, for example, of uh, how people seek to be represented in politics. And the conclusions of that data was they avoided things like political parties like the play. Uh, the person who didn't study coined the phrase the everyday maker, who described individuals, and you know, women who were concerned about uh, childcare facilities in 
a district called Norabrough, got together with other women, formed a little action group, went to see the local officials, discussed with the local officials, and one of them said, you know, I never thought that I'd ever be a politician, uh, but now I can chair a committee, I can write a minute, and so I went through all the kind of political skills that she'd acquired in the process of taking off. And it wasn't a pressure group in the sense that we normally use that phrase, this is a local citizens action group. And I wonder when we talk about representation, it's a mistake, I think, to always look upon it in terms of elections and party representation. I think the local effects come out also in the Norabro everyday maker and the way in which they engage with politics. And their engagement with politics is not around voting, it's around services. Mm -hmm. that's, where, that's where they do it. And there are a number of uh, studies, I think, that show that. There's a Henry Bang, I'm sorry, it's not really my area, which is why I'm slow with the references. I think it's Henry Bang. They had a really good critique of the uh, Richardson and the guy at Sheffield study of participation. Sheffield. Charles Patty? No, no. Probably retired now. Geriatric, I think. Was it Gamble? Hmm? Was it Gamble? No, it wasn't Andrew. No, 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 no. no. Oh, scientist. That's not <laughs> helping. He charged that he it was a bank bang did a very good critique of studies which focused on uh, the formal measures of representation participation and ignored these if you like less formal ways of becoming involved. But I, and I absolutely understand that. I've, I've written a paper on social capital and uh, mm. the representation of women and looked at um, the fact looked at different roles people take within organisations, leaders, foot, shots, foot soldiers and befrienders and guess which category the women are more often in. And I suppose I think the reason I, I accept that these kinds of activities are really important and they're often overlooked in traditional measures of political participation, but I still hold on to the kind of more classic narrow view because if it doesn't translate into party politics, or it doesn't have to be party politics, if it doesn't, have to, if it doesn't um, re translate into electoral politics, the power isn't distributed, <coughs> you know, and I suppose... What if that? What if it translates into the distribution of resources? Well, that'd be amazing, but I just don't believe it will unless you actually get yourself... Well, which gets the methods point, you know, yeah. that your survey-based data will never do that. What you actually need to do is that Robert Lane uh, kind of study, where you take a group of, e.g., 20 working class mm -hmm. voters, yeah. and sit down and talk to them for six months. Like why they're involved in politics, mm -hmm. what they're doing in politics. But if they are involved in politics, I, mean, I have done I have done focus group research with women and mm -hmm. actually working class people who are not interested in politics or say they're not. That's right. And yes. then of course they are interested in politics. But I suppose my issue, my concern, why I'm a political scientist and not a sociologist, is that um, women are no. massively involved in civic life. No, I did, did I do that? Yeah. Oh, I slipped that one in. It's, it's fine, it's a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> it was totally unintentional. Um, it's because I think if you look at activity in terms of civil society, and it's no coincidence that that was a, a group of women, um, wow. it, yeah, women are incredibly active, and I'm sure you know, other underrepresented groups are. But then if you move into politics, what issues get dropped off the election campaign? What issues are not in the manifestos? It's the issue. It's the issues of child. I mean, childcare actually because of this focus on these these. But women's issues are often sidelined, and so all this really important local activity, if it doesn't go right up the food chain, it, it doesn't necessarily. It might manifest itself in some local resources, but actually, in terms of the real distribution, um, it's not enough. Well, so, um, You're going to be difficult, aren't you? I'm going to be difficult. You're two baddies at the end. <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, so I'm not going to ask about external validity, right? But I actually, well, the question I'm interested in a little bit is what these attributes stand for. I think because actually, I think David, the struggling theorist, is getting at it, which was that it's really interesting to me on that on that on that red graph you had all the different effects and. I think there's some other interesting research out by someone about the effects of second income to all. Oh, that's me and Phil. Uh, uh, surprise, surprise! <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and the effect you found was biggest, right, was corporate uh, directorships. Yeah, right? yeah. what a big surprise that was. Yeah, so, but I think the interesting <laughs> thing to hear, right, is that the attributes that people respond to in survey experiments stand for certain other policy-related things as opposed to descriptive representation. So, for example, I mean, you know, it's all, it's all in the research, right? That the, the second incomes that people don't mind GPs, they don't like 
uh, people who are directorships who they think is being on the take and slacking. So what people are taking from all these forms of representation are, in our language, heuristics and cues about the character MPs. And, and so I wonder, actually, once we drum down to actual kind of outside the experimental context, as to whether, even notwithstanding the lack of party cues in this sort of experiment, experimental context, um, whether actually these are really attribute-laden uh, effects. So that if you go to a constituency with someone who isn't local versus a local candidate, uh, actually, so Anton Itch is a great example of how the candidate's already dealing with it, right? So the, the local, uh, what's his name? Um, Royston Smith, his, uh, his brand is like what you put on meat. It's like made in Salanto. It's if he's kind of you know, <laughs> born here, right? It's like it's kind of everywhere. And I think I saw one of my PhD students have tweeted a postcard he sent out. I had the word from Salanto in about 13 different places on a single postcard. Right? Versus a deeply educated journalist who came up in London two years ago. Right? So it's a great, it's a great example. But, but those things are powerful because of, of, of what they stand for. Uh, and so I wonder actually, those sorts of attributes are only going to have, have, have impact um, I've lost my track. Um, where they stand for something else, and so it's not the attribute. Of course, gender's made up, right? So it's always a heuristic standing for something else, isn't it? I mean, these things are all social constructions, so of course. Um, but moving on from that, one way of answering it, um, which is right, really. Um, have, you, have you read Oliver Heath's um, recent paper showing that to the class of MPs does matter in terms of? vote from working class voters. Um, also, I think that we'll be in a, I think Phil and I always say these things are artificial. This is about, you know, this is about trying to, to pick at particular aspects of a problem in a certain way and then you have to come at it from other angles. And um, you know, the, 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 sur the study I'm doing with Jennifer Hudson, um, where we're collecting background information about MPs and candidates from 1945 to 2015. We're better to do this kind of stuff that um, Oliver has done. But, you know, seeing what does it matter in local context, if we actually can tell if someone was born there or where they went to university, does it make a difference? But, um, you know, as for your bigger question, is it actually always really a cue or a heuristic? Well, somewhere along the line it is. Um, and, and I suppose, isn't that where I ended up? Didn't I end up saying Wollstonecraft was right and Burt wasn't? Um, that you can't unpick descriptive and substantive representation, that the two things are totally fused together. So we agree. <laughs> That's okay. I was that one. I was Ben. Can I ask about the um, Well, one comment first is that it's, it's perhaps not the best term because, in the context of people like Pitkin, it's often associated with independence versus mandate debate. So, independence mm -hmm. from the constituency rather than mm -hmm. independence, as you were talking about, the party yeah. line. Yeah. But the uh, question here is about how you're going to measure that because you took, if I understood correctly, the number of times that the MP votes against the party line to affect their independence. Well, as well as their dissenting from the party line, obviously. Okay. Um, intuitively, I'd have thought that someone could be 100% independent and yet happen to vote in the same way as the party. It's just that they don't vote that way because the party told them to, they make up their own mind. It just happens that you know, their own opinion conforms with... It seems rather unlikely. I mean, have you ever been involved in a political party? Um, I mean, the idea that you would, you would agree all the time, I mean, A, it seems... Well, I mean, it's a practically unlikely. I'm just wondering whether you can really take the sense to be a good measure of... Well, it's not what I take. It's, it's, it's devote, what do voters take, and voters seem to like it. And I, so what does it signal to voters? And I think to voters it signals independence from the party line. And I don't imagine voters probably think that, I mean, voters will think maybe there are some MPs who just agree with everything the party says, but they probably wouldn't like that either, even if it was really, truly, honestly believed, would they? So what the voters like is not independence, but dissent? No, I think, I think dissent and independence overlap, don't they? I mean, two different terms for, for, the, for a very similar thing. They, it, it, dissent is signalling independence, and independence, as you say, could be a latent quality that doesn't actually manifest itself in a visible way. But I think that's unlikely. Remember, I'm an empirical researcher, so you know, I think if, if it's there, you'll probably see it. Dissent is certainly signalling independence. If you're dissenting, you are independent. Yeah. Right? But you think you could be independent, independent signal, practice. and I just think that's really, occasionally maybe, but I mean, the whole point about political parties is 
it's an aggregator of opinion, and those opinions are not uniform, and you have to compromise. And so the idea that any individual member of the party, especially one that's motivated enough to be a representative for a party, would never disagree with the party line. Unless they were an authoritarian dictator, there's no way I can see that happening. I, I, I kind of wonder, actually, whether you, you, in a way, don't have a kind of, you know, sort of stronger uh, response to, to sort of bear on this. Because, firstly, in the figures, the table you showed, it was actually but Which one? Fair, well, the um, fairly independent very. Okay, so basically, fairly independent does better than very. So they're quite sensible. Independent, which is, which is kind of in. Well, in the, the confidence intervals overlap, so they're kind of equivalent. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but the other thing is, if you took to your example, you had uh, Sarah Wollstone and Philip Thingley. Holiday. Holiday. Um, so one's got 20% voting record against, one's only got 3.9. Yeah. But there's something about her self-representation in public life which gives her the reputation of independence even though she only dissents a small amount of time. So I think kind of ben, you know, Ben's hypothetical is essentially a kind of, almost like someone like Frank Field, okay, who established a reputation for being very independent even though a great deal of the time he voted for the Labour Party. Or Chris you know. Millen was actually quite yeah, a good point. I mean, it, it, exactly. So, you know, in a sense, I, I guess the, the point is that you can test for independence because you don't rely simply on votes against mm -hmm. the party and you also mm -hmm. look at these other ways. It could, but it's still manifesting itself. And I think Ben's point is that you, you could contain it, but it would still be there because you agree, basically because you agree. Yeah, but I mean, the question is, I guess then there's a different case between the person who's completely independent, um, but is silent about their independence, as it were, which I think is, is slightly implausible, and the person who's kind of independent, but, and as it were, exhibits that by, you know, asking different kinds of questions in select committees, by, you know, going on, you know, radio and TV and saying different kinds of things, than the straight party mm. version, but you know, makes it clear that they're committed to the party line. I mean, the person who's kind of silent about, about their independence, it's you know, is so just undetectable, basically. Yeah. basically. Yeah. Yeah. What we're talking about perceived independence. Yeah. But you can perceive someone to be independent just in the sense that they would be prepared to deviate from the party line. But they have to send some signal that gives you that idea, don't they? I, I do see your point that in a kind of abstract sense there could be someone who just agrees. I just think that the likelihood of that happening is pretty small. Well, the likelihood of it happening on every occasion is... Oh no, it's never on every occasion. These are, on, these are kind of the whole projected image. You know, so it, it's, it's, if you kind of think of how people think about their MP, they're just going to retrieve the most recent bit of information about them. That kind of, it, 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 they're not going to be keeping a, a real proper scorecard, are they? No. No, except for you, except for David. <laughs> <laughs> he's got a full list of everything yeah. he's ever done. Believe me, I, I, I look for his mistakes and um, <laughs> just. Oh no. no. Okay, Lester, did you? Have? Yeah, but I, I was wondering. I mean, because you have uh, uh, provide some partial answer or this, but I wonder, I wonder what is the role of political knowledge and political information in your theory about. Political, sorry. Political knowledge and political information where uh, in your, I mean, basically you presented that theory about the British work. And I wonder what is the role of, because in, in your experiment, uh, I mean, I have a similar question that, that you're asking is how these things interact when you change, or how does it change when you, when you into some variation of political knowledge or how... So in, in all of the survey experiments we have got a political interest variable and again we were surprised that it did moderate the effect a bit but not dramatically because often, you know, in a lot of the literature on public opinion political interest is the key kind of um, divider of people and it didn't seem to be in some of these kind of things that people like or demand. Um, in knowledge, we did have that knowledge measure of um, knowing about your MP so that was, and I like that as a knowledge score because it's actually genuinely sort of useful knowledge. If you know whether your MP is actually from the same part of you or not, that's 
quite important, rather than, you know, do um, opinion, do um, polling stations close at 10, which is kind of a typical critical knowledge question not that useful. Um, so I think, to, yeah, I, I think we do cover that to some extent. I think I haven't given you the whole rebellion paper. I think one of the critiques that came back from a reviewer is that we did a lot of analysis comparing partisans and non-partisans. And one of the reviewers said actually non-partisans break down into people who are just independent of party and people who don't care. And so I think we need to do a bit more work there to look at that. Just a thing here question about the experiment. There was that a random, I, I, I mean, could you provide some details about the experiment? Did so, um, the, 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 yeah, the split sample um, experiments, only one kind of word is changed or one aspect is changed, whether a man or woman or whatever it is, and that's done completely at random. Um, so, yeah, it's, 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 it, I suppose it's one of the things about the technology that's available now is that you, the, 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 pro, the process is automated, so it's just completely at random. Fantastic. I was going to, I mean, I, I was just going to read, if you find this out, but while you're here, I was going to ask. Because I'm kind of confused about that, actually. It seems like in order, I don't want to say this, but I was just curious, so like, it seems like in the vignette experiment, you would have, in, if you're going to vary things one at a time, you would have had to have, and you have like, I guess, what, like at least 10 different factors, you would have to have like, a thousand combinations of all your treatments, and then you'd have to have. Well, we're only doing them one at a time, remember? Right, so to get all the combinations and well, understand the effects so, of one. So time. we have got we have got a conjoint analysis, which literally does that, which is more common in marketing research, where actually individual respondents see five pairs of MPs, and they choose between them, and then in the data set you get uh, um, t for each respondent ten. Um, variables which are just whether they preferred the MP or not and those all those attributes are compared are, are completely at random and you get an enormous number of permutations and combinations which allows you to control for very specific factors now but the survey experiment is is less sophisticated in a way so all you can if you get John and George up um, we say we say in some of our experiments you lose is married with three children and, and the baseline has got no kids and then the test line has got kids. But what you have to do is swap that, but you only have to do the iteration to swap once. So you can have John with kids, George without kids, John without kids, George with kids, no one with any kids. So it's not, they're very simple, quite crude tests. And, and all you can ever really test is, you're testing the effect of taking away the words married with children. And you have to make an assumption about what people think when so they hear that. So each responder receives the pair. Yeah, oh, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. That, but there, there's, you know, I thought you were hitting on a different problem. But the, the problem, that, you know, there, 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 is, there, is a, there is a sort of problem that we, we are assuming that they see that married with three kids as indicating they've got children. And we'll, we'll kind of end with this because I think Rosie still needs a drink. Oh, I've always <laughs> needed a drink. <laughs> Um, thanks a lot. It seems that people uh, like lo local MPs, whatever that might mean, and they kind of like rebellious MPs. But unfortunately, we need uh, some MPs who, you know, become cabinet ministers, prime ministers, whatever. Um, and I don't know if you didn't, if if you had any res results or if anybody else did on whether people. I, I would assume people at least voters from the same party quite like it if their MP is a cabinet minister or, you know, has is an important job and they're like, oh, our MP is chancellor or whatever. Um, and how that might, you know, and how that might play out. In fact, they're just, in fact, they're just said, mm. we control for incumbency in those models. I'm not sure if we control for, I need to get the model up to see if we control for whether they were in the government. But I think we must have done because it's so obvious that they can't, they can't, they can't, rebel in terms of they can't if they're in a the government. Mm. Um, so obviously this is something you can only really test on backbenchers. Um, sure. So whether voters like the fact they're in the, in the um, government, I don't know. That's an interesting point. Maybe it, it, you get some payback, but of course then you're probably in a safe seat anyway, so you don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> That's your Nick Clay. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm more laughs> <obvious there. laughs> Thank you everybody for coming and thank Rosie very much for a really, really nice time.